Today on J Secchio Live, cities in chaos as looting continues. And the judge in Michael Flynn's case files his response to the writ of mandamus. Live from Washington, D.C., Jay Seculo Live. Phone lines are open for your questions right now. Call 1-800-684-3110. That's 1-800-684-3110. And now, your host, Jordan Seculo. All right, folks, again, depending on where you are in the country, things may have been quieter last night in other major cities, which kind of dominated the news cycle because a lot of the broadcasts are based there. So whether it's New York or Washington, D.C. or Los Angeles, obviously there was still a lot of unrest in cities like Atlanta, still still looting, still uh, protests that became riots or even during the day were riotous. But of course, so much focus was on Washington, D.C. around 645 p.m. Eastern time last night, and I want to go right to Thad Bennett, who's in Washington, D.C., on Capitol Hill, and Thad, uh, by the White House, you had the President of the United States uh, at the in the Rose Garden address the nation, uh, first on, on George Floyd and, this, and condemning the actions by the, the police in Minneapolis, specifically, that's how he started off, and then second, uh, telling governors and mayors across the country this is unacceptable, these riots and the looting, and that if you don't do something about it, I will. And, of course, that has caused this debate, uh, yet another debate within the, the debate of this. But in Washington, D.C., it was pretty clear how quickly the these riots can be moved, dispersed, and contained. First of all, Jordan, I mean, I thought the remarks struck the balance perfectly between the need to acknowledge the injustices that have occurred and then also the sober responsibility that the federal government has to secure the communities of America. I think the president addressed both of those, and I think it had an impact last night. I'll tell you, here on Capitol Hill, things are actually uh, pretty quiet right now. Now, that does change as day turns to night and people come in and try to co-opt uh, the demonstrations that are taking place that have been largely peaceful in Washington, except for the isolated events that you talk about, uh, Jordan. But but the interesting thing is the the comments that the president made really do reflect the reality that I'm seeing in the neighborhoods of Washington, D.C., where people of very different backgrounds are coming together and trying to find a solution. And I think that's what the president is aimed at. And quite frankly, Jordan, I think both sides of this equation that he's talked about are a part of that. You do have to engage in the dialogue. But the other thing that you have to do, Jordan, to enable in order to enable that conversation, you have to make sure that the violence is put down so the very communities that are being oppressed aren't victimized by it. That's what the president was trying to do with those remarks, in my opinion. And we saw, uh, D- Dad, a lot of confusion by the commentators in the media who rushed immediately to be on TV, you know, and start making comments condemning the president on this uh, without any knowledge of the Insurrection Act and thinking that he can't actually use that. There's this other law. Of course, there's a huge exception in the Posse Comatobus Act, Act, which allows the president to declare this insurrection and, by the way, doesn't need a governor to sign off on it. They can. Correct. They could be part of that team, but Thomas Jefferson didn't need that. During Reconstruction, they didn't consult uh, uh, for it, it was even utilized to put down the KKK as that dates back to post right after the Civil War. Well, you hit it exactly correct. And I think that the problem and I think this is the real problem here is that there is nothing that the president can do right now that anybody on the left is going to say, that's OK, that's a good idea that will squelch the violence, because that's what this is. We're dealing with violence right now. That is paramount. That's what this is. All right, folks, we come back. Remember, uh, yesterday, the judge in Michael Flynn's case had to respond. The DOJ respond as well to the Court of Appeals writ of mandamus. This is pretty un- uh, very unusual in the legal profession to see a judge having to respond to the Court of Appeals. So we'll discuss that as well. Andy Economy will be joining us, discuss both the laws that we're talking about with the Insurrection Act of 1807. Dates back to this when Thomas Jefferson was president of the United States. So literally, it was put into into action by our founding fathers in the United States, who who were part of the drafting of the Constitution and the setup of our of our laws. And they realized this was something that needed to be addressed early on to be able to handle what was happening in our country during the Revolutionary War, the subsequent wars in 1812. All of those issues that were rising to the top. We'll be right back.
Thomas Jefferson, Rutherford Hayes, Grover Cleveland, Woodrow Wilson, Franklin Roosevelt, Dwight Eisenhower, JFK twice, Lyndon B. Johnson, one, two, three, four times, George H.W. Bush twice. The president did not do it yesterday. I think what he did, Dad, he showed in Washington, D.C. how quickly these situations, which we do turn violent, can be dispersed. And then if you're on federal highways, if you're blocking interstate commerce, and if you're destroying businesses, he gave governors and mayors a chance to get things under control themselves. And in many parts of the country, things changed drastically. There were still problems in the bigger cities, New York, Los Angeles, Atlanta. But in Minneapolis, notice you're not seeing a ton of footage out of there from last night. You may be seeing it from two days ago. But if you actually watch closely in the news how things are tracking, you had George Floyd's brother condemn the the violence and say this must stop and we need to stop letting these folks from outside the communities destroy their own neighborhoods. And I think there's a significant change. I think the message, whether they're going to say they like it or not, they're of course going to say they don't like it in a lot of the media. And they're very New York and LA and Washington DC focused. Let's be truth about that too, because that's where they're headquartered. But dad, ultimately it obviously lit a fire. It lit a fire under these mayors because they empower. Yep. There's now an 8 p.m. curfew in New York City tonight. Uh, yeah, well, they had one yesterday at 11, which yeah. was kind of absurd. I mean, think about that for a minute. An 11 o'clock curfew. So what has that exactly accomplished? Not a lot. But now they've dropped it back to 8 o'clock. That's a good sign. Now, I want to go to Andy, <laughs> excuse me, Andy Economo on this because I think that what we're seeing with the utilization of the legal acts that are available – we're starting to see direct action here, Andy, from the president taking charge, making a difference. Well, that makes a difference entirely that the president has come out and said that he is going to potentially put the full power of the United States military into operation if the governors uh, and the mayors do not comply with their responsibilities to keep the peace and the order. And we refer to the Insurrection Act. And that Insurrection Act was enacted in 1807, and as Jordan pointed out, it has been used multiple times by multiple presidents as late as George H.W. Bush in 1992. And in order to invoke the act, the president would first have to issue a proclamation. And I'm going to read the language that the proclamation would have to say. And you can tell by the language how old it is, quote, to immediately order the insurgents to disperse and retire peaceably to their abodes within a limited time. That's what the statute says, and the president has the power to do that, and the president may indeed invoke that, which puts active duty United States military forces in the position of having to restore order in this country if he's got to do right. so. And I think by him saying that, Jay, he said something that a true president should say, and that is, I, if you don't take control, then the executive will. Well, I think that's exactly, I mean, I think that's exactly the point. Now, here, the interesting aspect of this, and I want to go to Than on this, and then Jordan, get your opinion too. But Than, let me ask you this. How do you see this playing out? I mean, in Washington, they, they had that initial reaction that Andy talked about, and then all of a sudden it was like, oh, maybe we do need to do something here. Yeah, I mean, I think there's you got to look at the difference between words and actions, Jay. I mean, because the mayor of D.C. and other leaders uh, didn't didn't like the president's comments. But what action did they take, uh, Jay? They moved the curfew from 11 p.m. to 8 p.m. And I will tell you, uh, the situation in Washington, D.C. was much better last night than it was the night previously, largely because of that. And, you know, that just goes back to the conversation that Jordan and I had at the outset of the broadcast here, where the president probably has the most difficult duty to balance of all the leaders here. He has a sober duty to secure the nation against the violence that's occurring. And he also needs to hear out the voice of those who feel like they've been wronged. And by the way, Jay, that latter goal is best accomplished when the first goal happens. And you heard that message from George Floyd's brother. So I think in Washington, D.C., as as peace starts to return and those voices are again elevated, I think those who are complaining about the president's action are going to start to diminish. Uh, Harry Hutchinson wrote, wrote a great article that is up on our ACLJ website. And let me encourage everybody that's uh, listening or watching the broadcast now, get that article. Fantastic. Jordan? Yes, I, I think, again, so we've got resources up at ACLJ.org, and we are going to get into in the broadcast as well, the situation with Mike Flynn, the judge. Uh, this, it's, it, this may be the first place you've had a full discussion of it uh, on the broadcast, and we're going to get into it more, of course, with 
Rod Rosenstein is, is still uh, confirmed to testify tomorrow on Capitol Hill uh, in the Senate Judiciary Committee. That's chaired by Senator Lindsey Graham. We know both of them will at least be in person. There could be other senators there as well. Uh, so it's not just something done uh, via telelink. And uh, I want to go to stand on this too because Capitol Hill, our office is in a place where, uh, again, when I saw those riots begin, I, I and I actually heard that, you know, just even – six blocks back from our office where it's outside the security perimeter for Capitol Hill and Capitol Hill police. There was, there were a lot of issues on Sunday, uh, even if it's sub sub yesterday, but mostly on Sunday, Saturday and Sunday night. How does it feel on Capitol Hill? Does it feel like the normal June? I mean, obviously things are different with COVID, but has it, does it yeah. feel the same way or is it different? It's peaceful, Jordan. And honestly, if anything, the number of bikers and walkers and, and uh, you know, uh, joggers that are out has increased from previous weeks as the, the phase one of the reopening uh, begins. And Jordan, I, I think that really just gives even more credence to the idea that most of the protesters, most of the demonstrators that are out during the day are peaceful, are trying to have a message heard. And then they really are co-opted as day turns to night, because uh, I'm telling you right now, around Capitol Hill and really all across Washington, D.C., you are going to see peace. You are going to see people in the streets, but you're not going to see the confrontation that you've seen on the news. And again, Jordan, I, I mean, you made this point, point previously, but I think people need to hear it again. When they see the images on TV of the violence, it is the president's a sober duty to make sure that those situations are put down. Uh, but Jordan, during the the day right now that's not what we're seeing that is just what the media is waiting to capture to show to the rest of america right now i wouldn't have any problem walking down the street all right 1-800 i mean that that i will tell you folks that's very telling because it's you're talking about 12 blocks away is the white house but you do have to go up the hill and capitol hill is on a hill and it, it is actually uh you will see protests all the time that have per, long you know they have to schedule out way in advance they shut down the streets for them those are because they want to take advantage of the police actually for the protesters. So that's a different kind of scenario. Yep. And they're, but they're extremely large. And so we have them go by our office all the time from every different group. Of course, at the Supreme Court in the big cases that come up. Uh, they haven't seen a lot of this with COVID-19, but obviously the country uh, rapidly also, I think there's also an expression there that's happening uh, as well of just uh, the, the fact that things were closed down, civil society closed down as well, and the kind of community uh organizations that we're used to like local churches uh and uh exactly. being open for prayer and dad i think that was part of you know part of the symbolism as well i do think what the president showed is how quickly and though the media tries to show it as this huge show of force i haven't heard about any serious injuries out of washington dc no this the, the force itself was what 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 quelled the act i mean let's yeah. be clear here i mean it's the force itself that got rid of the problem or at least uh, it stopped the violence from happening, which was the really the biggest issue that was going on here. Uh, Robert's calling from Maryland. I, let's take this here, Jordan, at, at the end of this segment, because we'll touch on this more later. Yep. But I, I want to take the call. Yeah, we're going to get into this. We come back in the next segment but in, in a more fully way. But, Robert, I wanted to take your call. And if you want to talk to us on air, one 800 684 Tim, we're also going to be updating you on Michael Flynn's situation. Robert, you're on the air. Yes. Hi. Yeah, I was calling specifically about the Michael Flynn situation. But before I ask the question about the Michael Flynn situation, uh, I think that, uh, you know, the situation that's taking place all over the country with the riots is very, very sad. Seeing the fact that it was an injustice what the police officer in Minneapolis did to George Floyd and that the police officer was fired and now is facing murder charges. I mean, that didn't happen many, many, many years ago, but it's happening in our era in which we're living in. And justice has been served in that from that standpoint. And I'm glad that George Floyd's brother is calling for an end to the violence. Um, right. So the question about Michael Flynn I wanted to ask, though, are the charges being dropped against Michael Flynn because of the injustice that actually took place against him? We're going to get into this in the next segment of the broadcast, but let me jump over here to Andy Economo first. Uh, and I, I will say this, Andy and I spent late to late last night reading the briefs that have been filed both by the lawyer representing the judge, which I'm still trying to figure that one out, Andy. And then, of course, the more importantly here, the briefs that were filed by Sidney Powell and by uh, the Solicitor General of the United States for the Department of Justice saying this judge was way out of line. But Andy, before we get into particulars, I've never seen this before. You and I collectively have been practicing law for 90 years. 90 years is right, Jay. And in 45 years on my part, I have never seen a judge want to become a litigant in a criminal case, or for that matter, in a civil case. 
the brief on the part of Judge Sullivan that was written by the Wilkinson law firm essentially says the petition for mandamus should be denied. Who are you to say that? You want walking off the street, you're the judge, you're the umpire in a contest between the government and the defendant, and now you're taking sides and, uh, and saying that the writ should uh, not be granted, and you want to become a litigant in the litigation? And at the same time, say that you can impartially rule on the government's motion and Flynn's motion. I say that's impossible, if not insane. As I said last week on the broadcast, and I, th- and I think today as well, we cannot forget what's going on in our country. Uh, that there, these things are continuing. That the, and and when, what would usually get a lot of attention and a lot of analysis has not yet uh, from, from a lot of national media outlets. We want to provide that for you on this broadcast as well. Uh, 1-800-684-3110 to answer your questions on Michael Flynn. To answer your question about the president's powers, if you've got questions about that, 1-800-684-3110. We'll be right back on Jay Secchio Live. All right, welcome back to Jay Secchio Live. This is Jordan Secchio, 1-800-684-3110. Phone lines are, are busy right now. Uh, your questions, comments. I, there was so, a lot of misinformation yesterday. I, I just do this from a legal perspective. And honestly, a lot of these news outlets were already talking about the president's powers in their writing, their written articles. They were talking about the president's powers back in uh, early on in their articles. I mean, we're talking uh, before the president spoke the day before, even on Monday, uh, at, at, uh, before, before he actually had addressed the nation so early on. Because they knew it was something being discussed, potentially, and that they were very honest about it then in the news. Now, now, if you go back to the same articles, you know, it's mostly about should the president have been outside of a church? I mean, this is kind of missing the point of the, the actual, which is what kind of powers the president have. And I even saw people like, you know, Don Lemon go on TV, and I don't expect him to agree with the president, but he also said point blank. He was one of the first people CNN had, had on after the president spoke that the president didn't even discuss George Floyd. And, and that's just not true. The president sp- spent the opening of his remarks were about George Floyd. That's how he started to address the nation. And he, he again, was one of the first people as a nas- a, 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 the national political scene and as the president of the United States to condemn this 100%. He, he didn't wait. This is not that. This is not that president, Dad. He saw right. what we saw, and he didn't need to have twenty advisors tell him how he should carefully thread the needle on this. Which, by the way, I will say this about President Obama's remarks: are very much fake looking. They look like they're written by a lot of people giving analysis and kind of special words, but don't want to say this, don't want to say that. The president came right out and said, "This is this is absurd. This is wrong." And he said that well, for I a think, week look, ago. I mean, it's it's not shocking to. I don't think it's shocking to look. To, it's not shocking to any of us that the, the that. Yeah, this is election year, and it's election year politics, so this is going to happen. But I think what we do have to put into perspective when looking at uh, General Flint's situation, I want to talk about this for a moment. We now have had briefs filed by the Department of Justice. We've now had briefs filed by the lawyer representing the judge. I keep saying that. I mean, representing the judge. It's unheard of. And then, of course, uh, uh, Cindy Powell filed the brief for General Flint. Let me give you my analysis. I don't want to hear Andy's. the judge's brief is basically this. Hey, look, don't take any action here because I may vote for Flynn. It's just a, I haven't done it yet. I just may, I may vote for Flynn, so it, it should be okay. Don't, don't take any action yet. Doesn't say he will vote for Flynn, but he says he could vote for Flynn. Then, I think this is important, Andy, you have the next brief, and that's the brief of the Justice Department saying, the se- Article 2 gives the authority to the executive branch to bring this to bring any action or to dismiss cases, not to the judge. That's exactly right, Jay. Article 2 makes the executive the prosecutor in the case and not the judge, which is an Article 3 function. What Judge Flynn wants to do is to be the judge, the jury, and the prosecutor. He wants to be the U.S. attorney and to be the judge in the case. Well, the U.S. attorney position is already filled, so he can't do that. I was very disappointed in the brief that was written on behalf of Judge Flynn. First of all, no brief should have been written written on behalf of a judge. A judge doesn't need a lawyer in a case. That's crazy. 
But the the brief itself, Jay, uh, adverted to what the judge had said about, I'm doing this briefing schedule, and I'm ordering these Judge Gleason to be an amicus based on my inherent authority. That's what he used. And in reading the brief on behalf of Judge Flynn, I kept wanting to see what is this inherent authority based on? What law? What case? And it was nothing. They referred to law from the 18th, uh, 17, uh, 18th century, 19th century, and a 1947 law review article that was written by somebody. It was very poorly written and very poorly argued, and it never addressed the central question. When does the judge in, the, in a criminal case also become the prosecutor? The answer to that was provided yep. by the Justice Department brief, and the answer to that is never. Yeah, an interesting Than Bennett that uh, members of Congress filed briefs in that case as well, House and Senate. They, they sure did, asking uh, largely the same question, how many roles does this judge expect to play? But then also arguing the point that we've made on this broadcast many times, Jay, is that there's a very specific reason that the judge, a, a member of the Article Three branch, does not get to play this role. It's because the founders intentionally gave it to a branch with more direct accountability to the American people. The Article Two branch, who obviously the leader is directed by the voters and it's confirmed by the Article One branch, who are directly uh, uh, elected by the voters. That was not an accident, Jay. So that is largely the argument uh, that the that the House and the Senate are interested in making. It's not just an accident that the judge doesn't have this power. There's a very specific reason he doesn't. And by the way, Jay, if we lose that, if the Article Two branch does not have prosecutorial discretion, uh, it's going to cut against people of all ideologies at some point, depending on 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 who what judge they get before. You know, Jordan, I wanted to get your view on this because we are, in, as you said earlier, we're in the middle of a political season. How does this play out? Yeah, I, I think, listen, when you have a situation, I, I think you pinned on something that that probably doesn't get, it certainly hasn't gotten enough attention yet, but but should in the media, that I think people need to understand. This did, this judge did not respond on his own. I think right there he's, dis, he's disqualified potentially, uh, and it's so bizarre that he has an outside attorney, not part of the government, not part of his staff, Assist him, uh, they wrote this on the hat. It's their name that is on the. It's like a brief, you know, just like a brief. Uh, but he, they're using his power as a federal judge. Why is he going yeah. to outside outside the government? Who is? What's he talking to them about? Because he doesn't. He he doesn't have the ability to do that. To go outside. No, he doesn't. His role. I think by talking to outside staff, he's in more trouble than he was a week ago. No, this I think brief just it, underscored it to me. It was weird that he hired outside counsel. It was weird that they. It's their names on it to me. I, why is Beth Wilkinson and her team the name on the brief? I'll tell you why. They because wrote I, they, they, the judge needed thought he needed a lawyer. Yeah. I mean, they just I want you to think about that for a moment. The judge thought he needed a lawyer in this case, and he hires a well-known criminal defense lawyer. That criminal defense lawyer puts in place what a a a series of legal arguments, which, as you said, are really old. And what do you end up with? We now end up with a, a three-part proceeding. We've got the D.C. Court of Appeals. We've got the United States, four parts, the United States government. We've got General Flynn. And as a party, kind of, right now, we have the judge. Who ever heard of this? Well, I never heard of it, Jay. I can tell you that. A judge being a prosecutor at the same time as being a judge? When the government says we don't want to prosecute a case, what is he going to do? Is he going to sit from the bench and say, okay, uh, I'm the judge in the case, and I'm also the prosecutor, by the way. I'm going to start calling my first witness. That's what it really comes down to. Okay, judge, call your first witness in the case, and then you're going to judge the credibility of that witness and also prosecute the case on behalf of yourself? You're not the executive. You have no business injecting yourself into the actions of the executive branch of government. You don't have inherent authority. I didn't see any case cited, Jay, whatsoever in their brief. As I say, I saw law from the 1800s and a 1947 law review article and talk over and over again about he's going to do the right thing and he hasn't ruled and he hasn't made a decision and he's going to think about this and he's going to make a decision about Flynn and you can appeal that. I say that's not nonsense and don't try to pull that stuff all right folks we come back we're gonna take your phone calls your comments your questions 1-800-684-3110 we've opened some phone lines 1-800-684-3110 
uh, two pieces now up at ACLJ.org. One from Harry Hutchinson on the response and the, the riots in response to the police brutality. And another by Wes Smith, who comes out of the military with a military perspective on what the president was discussing and the powers we've discussed on the air. We'll be back. Second half hour of Jay Secchio Live coming up. 1-800-684-3110. Get your calls in now. Live from Washington, D.C., Jay Sekulow Live. And now, your host, Jordan Sekulow. All right, folks, uh, phone lines are busy now, but I encourage you to call if you've got questions, comments. Two issues we're discussing. One, have explaining what the president addressed yesterday. Here's where the media got it wrong. Let me just walk through this one time. Remember they kept saying the president doesn't have power to use the Insurrection Act? What about the Posse Comitatus Act? Oh, wait. It has a giant exception that says, unless the Insurrection Act, which of course all laws have exceptions to the main, the general focus of the law, and the exception there in part of the U.S. Code is that this is not to impede on that power, which has been in place since our founding fathers were president, including Thomas Jefferson. Why? Because what they tried to do early on in the country is figure out what were the issues that weren't addressed in the Constitution. What what powers do we need to, to delegate? And they were delegated. By, by the legislative branch to the executive branch to act in these situations which are clear to anyone seeing it. You know, you don't, you know, what is insurrection? It's easy to see. It's easy to see. It's when you've lost control of the streets, when you can't protect private business anymore. Whether or not you don't have a strong enough police force, whether you need more resources, whether your city is so large. So then they said, well, you can do it, but only if the governors ask you. Well, the governors can agree to it. That's true. They can agree. Do they have to? Uh, they didn't for JFK. He didn't wait. He didn't wait when they needed them in Alabama for desegregation or Mississippi for desegregation or in Arkansas. He didn't ask. The governors weren't going to okay that, regardless they were Democrats for the most part. Same party of, uh, that he was in. They weren't going to be okay with that. Now, did uh, so you have this this issue where it goes back and forth. Rutherford B, for B. Hey, they're not sure on Thomas Jefferson. He did it, but I think you know, it was so early on in our history, they're not clear. So Rutherford B. Hayes, he did ask. Uh, uh, the state requested it. Grover Cleveland, the, the next president to do it, didn't get the state. Uh, and again, I talked about John F. Kennedy. Uh, he was not asked by Mississippi to help desegregate Ole Miss. And there were riots. And you had to protect the students. And you had to protect that. We've all seen those images out of the civil rights movement. But it's the, it, it's the same thing for every American that has basic protection that if they are at their business or they're going to check, that they're not going to be dragged out of a car and beaten in the street. Well, that's the general idea, I mean, is that you're not going to get beaten up. Uh, it, I said this yesterday in the program. Let me, let me say it again because I think it's important. I've defended civil disobedience. I mean, blockades of abortion clinics. I have defended free speech activity, picketing, protest. That's protected speech when it's picketing and protest. When you blockade, you're, you are violating a law. It's trespass, but it's not, uh, it's not arson. It's not, uh, destruction of property. If the, I've never handled a case involving, uh, destruction of property. The cases I've handled have all involved situations where it's either been civil disobedience or just pure free speech protests. There's a big difference between those two. And Andy, you know, you were with me on those cases all the way to the Supreme Court. We won them all, by the way. We won them uh, one nine to zero, the other one uh, six to three. So there's a big difference between civil disobedience and protected speech. And 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 protected speech, you cannot be penalized at all. Civil disobedience, as Dr. King said, yes, you could pay a penalty for that. He wrote the letter from the Birmingham jail because he engaged in peaceful civil disobedience. But that was very different than what was going on the other night. But the president utilizing authority here, Andy, is to maintain protection for citizens. That's exactly right, Jay. The Insurrection Act, if the president invokes it, is to disperse the citizens who are out there in rebellion and to make them go, to use the language of the 18th, uh, 18th century, 19th century, back to their places of abode. In other words, get off the street and go to your house. And the way I'm going to enforce it is take active duty United States military and implement them because the governors and the mayors won't do it. This is the perfect instance in which the, the president should act 
and he's got the authority to do so. Other presidents have done it in lesser situations, perhaps. President Trump has the right to do it, and he has the mandate to do it, and I think he has the courage to do it, and that's the most important of all. Carefully delegated powers to the President of the United States since our founding, and at a time when the left, now they don't like federal intervention. It's funny how that changes depending on who the president is. We'll be back. Picking and choosing federal power. This is a big issue I think will, again, it's unfortunate because it's divide, it divides the country, but I think this is where you look at the left's interpretation of the law. So whether they're, yep. they support Judge Sullivan today because they think, oh, because they like the fact that he is questioning whether the Department of Justice is right. And, and should he be the one prosecuting Mike Flynn now uh, and bring in his own prosecutor, which he's trying to do with this outside Which judge? he has no authority to do. Uh, yeah, None, no. no authority to do. I mean, this is the thing. If he wants to hold somebody in contempt, he doesn't need an outside lawyer to hold somebody in contempt. Do it. How no, about he just do, do why anything. does he, he need so many advisors? I don't think – at that point, has he – I think he's gone past just – Issues of I mean, this could be you know what he's a criminal defense attorney for a reason. They didn't want to get into that necessarily, obviously in their brief, but real issues for this judge. Well, one of the real issues is he he saying? appoints. Well, he first he's talking to his lawyer. You know, how appropriate is that? He's talking to his lawyer about his opinion in a case he brought because it was brought up to, on a writ of mandamus on a decision he made. And, and think about this. I've thought about this a lot. And that is, you have a situation where General Flynn files this writ of mandamus, and then the judge is ordered to respond. He responds by hiring a lawyer, and the lawyer file, files a brief saying, hey, wait a minute, the judge may even end up ruling in favor of Judge Sullivan, who uh, 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 General Flynn, who knows, don't prejudge it. Which, But you know, the lawyer he hired, the amicus he hired, mm-hmm. And this is interesting. The amicus he hired to prosecute, and that's what I'll say, General Flynn, had written an op-ed criticizing, Andy, the Department of Justice. When I saw that, I couldn't believe that he chose, he had no right to, but he chose Judge Gleason uh, to do that. Of all the people to choose as somebody who has expressed already an opinion with respect to the case. I mean, first of all, it's unheard of for a judge, as Jordan said, to hire a lawyer to give him an opinion on how he ought to rule in a case. You're the district judge appointed by the president. You confirmed by the Senate. You rule. You don't ask other people how to rule. I mean, that's not your job. And who do you pick to be your amicus or to be your co-prosecutor, because that's what it is? Someone who's already expressed an opinion with respect to General Flynn. How crazy is that? I'm, I cannot believe, I cannot believe that in the year 2020, this is happening in the United States judicial system. I am hoping the D.C. Circuit will put some sanity back into Judge Sullivan and into this Flynn case. Look, the law is very clear. Under Rule 48, you have an unopposed motion to dismiss a criminal case filed by the government unopposed by the defendant. Judge, you've got one alternative. Rule in favor of vacating the plea and be done with it. Or if you don't want to do that, sentence the man. Yeah, I mean, that's the thing. This judge is trying to have it both ways. And then he's playing a game and he's bringing yeah. in people and you've got to understand. I, I don't think you have to imagine now we can actually say definitively he's discussing judicial analysis with people who are not even part of the government. They're not part of the judicial branch. They're not his clerks. They're not his... They're not part of the, the court system. No, he's, he's, he is relying on people in private practice, Dad, and and that again, yeah. he's not a he he invo- he kind of did this to himself. Obviously, he stepped into it multiple ways uh, with this, but he did it by trying to appoint an outside prosecutor. He doesn't have the power to do that. He he can't appoint a special counsel. He can rule. He has power as a judge. He doesn't have to take, and they can be appealed. Like, but he didn't do that here. He started. He started obviously having analysis, and I think that is a serious. Conflict issue, serious problem issue. Listen to Sidney Powell. This is Mike Flynn's attorney. Take a listen. It's clear from his brief, Lou, that the judge has abandoned any pretense of impartiality and wants to prosecute General Flynn himself and conduct a mini trial 
over whatever issues he chooses to identify in the case, regardless of what the attorney general has decided and done here, even going back to charges that didn't exist in the first place and creating some new ones as well. Uh, we don't know this, Dad. We know the staff are representing the clients who were targeted by the IRS. Yep. Uh, they tried to loop in the FBI. Now it makes more sense. Why? They had a captive audience of people who wanted yep. to take out voices they didn't like, whether it was President Trump's, Mike Flynn's, uh, a, a general of the United States, uh, to uh, who was chosen by the duly elected incoming president of the United States to be his national security advisor, which is his prerogative. And they, they tried to take them out and basically take out the entire first team of leadership for the president of the United States. I, I tell you this, oh, there's no doubt about that. We know that because we had a three-year investigation where we dealt with it. So yeah. we, 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 we've dealt with that. But there's another aspect of this in, in the Flynn case, and that is the, it, the we, we haven't even rehearsed the series of irregularities that took place here. And there are, they're legion. I mean, there, yeah. there are so many. Uh, the, but the government did. I mean, that was what was interesting in the brief by the Department of Justice. Andy, they did. They talked about it. And they are the government. And they talked about it. Yes, they did. The brief was that was written by Solicitor General Francisco and the staff of the Department of Justice starts out with the fundamental. Always look at the first line of a brief because that says it all. Look at the first line in the opening statement. The Constitution vests in the executive branch the power to decide when and when not to prosecute potential crimes period. That's an executive decision. It's not a judicial decision. And especially not to say, well, let me see, I've got a motion to vacate a plea. I believe I'll call my friend Judge Gleason in here to argue against the Justice Department's motion to dismiss. And he's already expressed his opinion with respect to Flynn and then doesn't like President Trump, but he's going to be my aide and counsel. And more than that, I'm going to hire me a lawyer to respond to yes. what the D.C. Circuit Court of Appeals has said I did, and I have to explain. What is going on? This is It, it, it boggles the mind, Jay. I can't it, understand it. No, it does. And then I wondered, about, I wondered about this, Andy, and that is, so he has this private lawyer, and he's got this amicus curie. He's got this judge that he's appointed. Do they get together and decide that this is how we should decide this case, that this is the safest way to decide this case if we rule this particular way? I mean, is that what oh, this that, becomes in the end? That that sounds like very well could be the scenario, which would be the most t terrific parade of horribles I can ever imagine, to, to have an amicus curiae to argue against dismissal, and not only that, Jay, but to consider additional criminal charges. Well, are you the judge? Or are you the prosecutor? You want to be both? And I, I, well, that's what I, apparently he does. Go ahead, Jordan. Yeah, I think th there's also another issue that hangs out there, and uh, then we'll start taking some phone calls. But, Dad, this this issue, too, of being held in contempt for withdrawing a plea, the plea is between the prosecutor and the and – the, and the, we know that this is part of our, our the judicial system that – a, a lot of times dr charges get dropped down, even in this. You know, what they wanted to go for at the FBI and the DOJ – wasn't exactly what they got in the meantime, and they said we won't we won't go after your we're going to go after your family, you know they're going to go after this and that, and when the Department of Justice looked at, it, by the way, the the general counsel for the FBI resigned during all the midst of this. No one, you know, it's not getting yep. a ton of news again. Dana Bente, who, who uh, he is gone, um, he was part of this, signing off on these FISA, signing off on Flynn. Uh, That's why I a think lot has happened, that, and by also. Yep. The assistant U.S. attorneys, career prosecutors have signed this brief from the Department of Justice. It was not just political appointees. It was also career uh, assistant U.S. attorneys signing on. Yeah, I think that was very, very important that you saw Department of Justice long-term employees sign on to this brief, which was, by the way, completely legally correct. I, I want to be clear on that. Uh, the analysis was excellent. Uh, but as Andy, to underscore what Andy said, I mean, this whole process with the judge having a lawyer and then having the amicus, and the amicus has already written an opinion to the Washington Post. I mean, it's just not the way it's done. And I think at a minimum, the writ of mandamus should be issued. This judge has to be removed from this case. The dismissal should be granted. Maybe they have to appoint another judge 
They may have to recuse him to appoint another judge who can actually do the proper dismissal action. I've thought about that too, Andy. That may be the way they have to go here. Uh, Get rid of this judge, put a new judge, order the dismissal, because at this point, you can no one can argue that Judge Sullivan is a neutral arbitrator. No, that would be crazy to say that he's neutral. He's already expressed an opinion, even though he protests in his brief, that he hasn't really decided and he's going to give Flynn a fair shake and then Flynn can appeal it. That's nonsense. You can't tell me that after I've read your brief, that you're neutral and impartial. You've called the man a traitor. You've made these statements about him and you've you've expressed an opinion of his guilt or innocence already. And then you're going to now rule on his motion to vacate the plea. I think what you say is actually correct, the D.C. Circuit should probably order recusal, appointment to another judge, and disposition of the case by vacating the plea. All right, folks, we come back. We are going to start taking uh, the phone calls. Uh, If you've got a call, a question on either of of the matters uh, we've been discussing on radio, again, 1-800-684-3110. If you have a comment, it's 1-800-684-3110. We'll start taking those when we come back from this next break. Uh, Final segment coming up. Again, and there's a lot of resources too. Great resources at aclj.org. Uh, just posted today, right before we went on air, uh, a piece by Harry Hutchinson, another piece by Wes Smith. One focusing it on how the riots harm the issue that we should be uh, should be getting the national discussion and talk about uh, you know the president sitting down like he did with criminal justice reform on this matter. But you've got to stop the riots first, and also on the response to the riots, what the federal government can and can't do. One eight hundred six eight four thirty one ten. I want to go right to the phones uh, first on uh, Mike Flynn's case because you've got the situation there where the judge has responded through private counsel. We've said uh, uh, honestly absurd that is on, on its face, absurd, bizarre, wrong. At that before that happened, you should recuse yourself as a judge. You should just recuse yourself. It, you shouldn't get to this point because. Outside counsels who are not part of the judicial branch of the U.S. government shouldn't be putting analysis together about why a judge is right, and they're criminal defense attorneys, so they're doing it in a defensive posture. Think about that. Well, they're in a de- yeah, they are in a defensive posture because what they did put themselves in a defensive posture. I want to quickly go to Than, and we'll hit the calls. Than, were you surprised that both Congress and members of Congress and Senate filed briefs in this? I wasn't, but what was your sense of it? Yeah, not surprised, Jay, because it is such an affront to the balance of powers. I mean, 11 members of the House wrote a very long brief. And then the Senate brief, Jay, it was led by Leader McConnell. And I think that shows you the extent to which it rises to significance in their mind, especially, Jay, when you consider that this judge that uh, Judge Sullivan appointed, Judge Gleason, back in 2013, as you know, uh, very clearly opined on this, saying that the executive branch has near absolute power to dismiss a, a case. Jay, he said it in multiple versions. How is that suddenly missing from the arguments he's making to this court? I think that's exactly why the Article 1 branch uh, decided that they had to weigh in. Let me go right to the calls. Let me go to Robert in Florida on line three. Robert, welcome to Jay Secchio Live. You're on the air. Hey, how we doing? Hey, uh, you might have answered my question, but I wanted to know is why can't another judge overrule Sullivan's decision and, and well, investigate him and on why is he more part of this case than being just a judge? Listen, he could potentially face those issues. I'm not speculating there to to some extent because he hired a defense attorney. So criminal defense attorney, uh, he's now uh, got outside counsel defending him. So he knows that's a potential, Robert, long term. Short term, Dad, the situation, the, the court has already stepped in. The next level up has already stepped in. This is not, yeah. they stepped in in a way that is also unusual, uh, that is not usually done because they because it was so outside the 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 lines of judicial power. No, that's exactly correct. So the Court of Appeals is the court of review here. The writ of mandamus was filed so that the Court of Appeals can then make a determination as to what Judge uh, Sullivan did, whether it was within the bounds of what he's calling this inherent authority, which he still has no citation for. I suspect the answer is going to be no. I think they're going to remove him, and I think the case is dismissed. All right, folks, uh, continue to take your phone calls, 1-800-684-3110. Let's go to Izzy in Idaho on line one. Izzy, thanks for holding on. You're on the air. Thank you for taking my call. Uh, just a quick question. Um, first of all, I, uh, I support Trump. I'll vote for him again. But my question was, um, was there a reason he waited as long as he did before he decided to take action? I thought it, my opinion was 
just because she was hoping the mayors and the governors would take care of all the rioting. And when they did, and it's when he stepped in. But I was just curious, why? Is there a reason he waited as long as he did? Just some- it, I, I, my analysis, it's a, it's a weighty as president of the United States to send the U.S. military in. And so you, those are these times throughout history. It has been done a number of times. But it is done in moments you know from history or you lived in history. It's those those rare events that you can remember forever or maybe sometimes. I mean, those Rodney King riots were maybe one of the first things I can really remember seeing. It's kind of like O.J. Simpson's case. These were massive, huge events, whether it was because of the media, or whether it was the civil rights movement that we learn about in school, regardless of where you go to school, you learn about those students in Mississippi and Alabama Arkansas, you learn about what happened there. So, Dad, these are these are weighty moments, and you do. The, our yeah. government is set up where the states are the first to utilize police power, and it's only when there is an – it is like an insurrection where they have lost control as a state. That's right. And that's so, what our, uh, our – and I think it takes more than a day to say that. No, I think you're 100% correct, and I think that – I'm going to go to Andy on this too because Andy has done – and so have I. We represented the state. I I was a special uh, uh, deputy attorney general for Alabama. I've been a special district attorney, assistant district attorney. Andy has done the same. He's been a U.S. prosecutor. I worked for the Treasury Department as a lawyer. So we know that the order is states to deal with this first. But when the state cannot deal with it effectively, Andy, that is when uh, the federal government comes in. I mean, that's the way our Constitution is set up. That's right, Jay. You've got this balance of power between the branches of government and the federal, the central government, and the states. The states have the first authority to keep the peace within their own jurisdictions. The mayors, the police, and the governors of the states, they're sovereign and they have that power. But Congress, in its wisdom, in 1807, enacted a law that says where that doesn't happen, the president has the power to invoke the active United States military to get involved. I remember as a child seeing uh, Governor Wallace blocking the entrance to the University of Alabama and Attorney General Katzenbach standing there with a federalized National Guard behind him so the student can come in. I remember as a child seeing in the University of Mississippi Governor Ross Barnett blocking the doors so that the black student could not come in and the Attorney General standing with a National federal uh, National Guard behind them and military troops deployed by the federal government. Those are those instances that I remember as a child seeing. So this is not anything new. President Trump, to answer the caller directly, has shown enormous restraint and deference to the states to do their responsibility. When he sees that they haven't done it, he steps in. Let me tell you something. Bill de Blasio took significant different action. One, it was the first curfew in new york city since 1943 and now it's at 8 p.m and for a city like new york that is really early that's really early to say if you're on the street we can arrest you and that's the state taking that action and the city taking that action so even at a more local level and that's the way the united states should work the insurrection act is when it doesn't so hopefully those steps are the correct steps they tried at 11 p.m curfew i think that was Way too late, but I do want to, it is tough to put in curfews if you didn't have it already midday because people that work different hours, different shifts, it's tough. They got to commute there. They've got to get on mass transit, the people who are there. Though most of the city is shut down. And a lot of people, Dad, who are from New York said, or a lot of folks who have said, and Than, you know this from Washington, D.C. as well, a place that's just getting into phase one. Uh, and so where you are in the country really matters. But you do wonder, too, wasn't it already illegal to be on the street? Or or they were already arresting people for being on the street without masks or not having the right distancing or you shouldn't be at your business and that. So this was actually the easiest time to put in place curfews, even in a city like New York. And I, I think that they've taken additional steps because they want to try and 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 not have to be in that situation where it's it's easy to see that the Insurrection Act should be invoked. 
Yeah, D.C. made a similar move last night following New York's lead, Jordan. The curfew moved back from 11 p.m. to 8 p.m., and it did a couple of things. It made the streets safer. Uh, Jordan, the other thing it did, it gave more space to the legitimate demonstrations that were going on. I mean, you have made this point several times this week. Uh, George Floyd was murdered. Ahmaud Arbery was murdered. And the violence that we're seeing in our streets, Jordan, it is keeping that conversation from taking place. So the president stepping in, the city's doing a more responsible thing. It quiets the streets down. And Jordan, it gives more space for that peaceful protest of a legitimate injustice for that to air and for that to get the coverage that you see on your TV screens. We have great pieces up at ACLJ.org. I encourage you to check out the piece from uh, Harry Hutchinson and Wes Smith uh, on two different issues that have arisen now uh, that we're discussing as a nation. Pray for your country. Pray for your, your nation. Pray for its leaders. And in a time, it's again, with COVID-19, reopenings, riots, looting, George Floyd and and the police brutality. These issues are real. But on but tomorrow, you know, Rod Rosenstein's testifying in the US Senate. We have to pay attention to those issues too as they develop.